Oh yeah, there's definitely genetic factors that will lead more people to be addicted to different substances. For example, about one in five people have significant nicotine receptors in their brain. We all have nicotine receptors in our brain, but one in five people have it much stronger than others. So people who don't have those receptors might smoke a cigarette and say, oh, it's nothing and not do it again. But if you've got a really strong level of nicotine receptors in your brain, one cigarette and you're hooked. And it's the same thing with alcohol. Welcome to the Eat, Live and Move podcast by Miyagi, a space where we bring you the latest science-backed conversations, expert insights and practical tips relating to all things health and wellness. Hello, I am Dr. Gina Cleo, your personal habit change expert. And I'm Dr. Ross Walker, a cardiologist and preventative health expert. Together with our 60 plus years of collective experience, we're on a mission to help you improve your health and transform your habits so you can eat, live and move better one episode at a time without the fluff or the fads. Today's episode is part two of our series on the reward system. We'll be taking a closer look at practical ways we can balance our dopamine levels. So in part one, we discuss some of the neuroscience behind dopamine and the reward system in our brain and how that impacts our behavior and drives us to do things we don't necessarily want to do. That's right. Like scrolling in our phone or snacking when we're not hungry or pressing snooze on our alarms, all those things that feel so pleasurable, but we know probably aren't great for us. So here are some important recaps from the last episode. We talked about how dopamine is involved in the drive or the experience of wanting. It's that feeling of anticipation. Dopamine levels, think of them like a currency that determine your level of motivation and drive and pleasure. For every pleasure, we experience pain. So that pain and pleasure sit on that same seesaw where on one end is pleasure, on the other end is pain. And when we experience pleasure, like say eating a piece of chocolate, our brain wants to bring that seesaw back into balance. So we feel good, our brain wants to bring it to balance, so we experience pain which takes us below baseline. And it doesn't feel good. It actually feels rubbish. It feels like we're not motivated, like we're tired, like we don't want to get off the couch. We just don't want to stop doing the things that we know we shouldn't be doing, which is also why when you do eat that first piece of chocolate, you're already thinking of the next one. This pain pleasure balance is also the reason why we tend to do these things, these like pleasure seeking behaviors, especially when we're not feeling that great, when we're bored or stressed or frustrated or we're anxious, we tend to do things like eat more or go on social media or game or that kind of thing. Yeah, and I've, got, I've got to say to you, Gina, I, I've been practicing medicine for 40 years, which is where the 60 years of experience comes in. <laughs> I've contributed far too much to that. But I've n- never seen anyone in 40 years of practicing medicine who actually benefited in the long term by following their urges. And, and often this dopamine yes. rush that people are after, if you're doing it, I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a bit of pleasure. That's part of why we exist. But to, to go overboard in this, I've never seen anyone who benefited from it. And here's where the question is, when do urges become addictions? That's the big issue. Mm. That's a great question, Ross, and that's definitely something that we're going to cover in today's episode, as well as we're going to cover how we can actually balance our reward system and our dopamine levels so that we can feel less impulsive and less drawn to these things that give us this high sense of pleasure, and also so that we can feel a bit more content. You know, for most of human existence, we've lived in this world of scarcity. If you think of the caveman days, it was scarcity or a bit of danger, like a lion or something around. So for us to survive, we had to be external seekers. Whatever we found that contributed to our chance of survival, whether it was food or shelter or a mate, it had to be intensely pleasurable for us. And that pleasure had to then eventually end so that we were motivated to find it again. If we only felt pleasure one time, then we wouldn't be driven to want to feel that pleasure again. When the pleasure ends and it feels bad, we're like, oh, we want to feel that pleasure again. And so that's what gives us that drive for further rewards. It's actually an absolute genius way of making us 
driven to do things. But now this is a really great system if we're living in a world of scarcity. The problem is though, we are not living in a world of scarcity. We are in the modern world where dopamine and these easy pleasures are everywhere all the time with technology, with fast foods, with whenever we want some dopamine, it's usually within an arm's reach, isn't mm. it? Well, the interesting thing I just heard you saying, we, we keep seeking that dopamine rush. And you think about it, if, if sexual activity didn't feel any good, we wouldn't be able to perpetuate the species. So that's why it's one of the reasons we get that dopamine rush with that. That's actually, I've never even thought about that. That's a pretty good mm. point. There you go. <laughs> You know, and it's why it's important to keep our dopamine levels in balance, because as you know by now, that there are really negative effects to having too much dopamine. In the last episode, Dr. Ross talked to us about uh, dopamine tolerance, how we can, like first one piece of cake's all we need to feel really satisfied. And then the more we do that, the less that one piece of cake is going to be enough. Next minute, we're going to need two pieces, then three pieces. And now we're delving into the realm of addiction. So addiction, the more we do things that can be addictive, the more our neural pathways in our brain begin to crave the rewards. They begin to predict that we're going to get them at some certain time. The difference between habits and addictions, I often get asked this question, is that it actually comes down to this reward system. Our habits give us some sort of reward. Every habit gives us a reward, but addictions give us way bigger rewards. And so we chase them more. We crave them more. We get more withdrawals from them. Also in the definition of addiction, they're essentially things that we're doing that are harming us in some way, that they're not beneficial for our life whatsoever, yet we continue to do them. We feel a lack of control over them. And actually, Ross, this is a really good question. What's your idea or I guess, have you read any research around addiction and the hereditary or genetic nature of it? Oh, yeah, there's definitely uh, genetic factors that will lead more people to be addicted to different substances. For example, mm. About one in five people have significant nicotine receptors in their brain. We all have nicotine receptors in our brain, but one in five people have it much stronger than others. So people who don't have those receptors might smoke a cigarette and say, oh, it was nothing and not do it again. But if you've got a really strong level of nicotine receptors in your brain, one cigarette and you're hooked. And it's the same thing with alcohol. Wow. About one in 20 people have a very strong gene for alcohol addiction. And people say, well, how do I know I've got the gene, doctor? you know, and I don't need to tell you. Um, so so it, it's, it's when you know you can't do anything about it. And another point I wanted to make about mm. addiction is the really illegal drug. So, for example, one hit of free base cocaine known as crack and you're instantly addicted. It just completely hijacks your nucleus accumbens, the pleasure centre, and that's all that gives you pleasure after that. You just seek that stuff. It's horrible, horrible stuff that can completely ruin your life. And it's crazy because I know that we can get addicted from just one time yep. use. I think people often think that addictions is something that you've started off as a behavior and it mm. turned into a habit and then eventually became an addiction. It doesn't no, happen like always. that. Sometimes addiction is that first time your brain's like, whoa, life is never going to be the same without this. I'm going to need this in my life moving forward in order to feel normal yep, again. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's terrifying. I knew that we had receptors in our brain for alcohol. I didn't know that nicotine as well, that one in five people that you mentioned had these nicotine receptors. That is so fascinating. My dad used to smoke. He doesn't anymore, thank goodness. His emphysema got the better of him and he decided he really needed to quit. It's a breathtaking and disease, that emphysema. <laughs> Oh, Ross, you're at it Sorry. again. Sorry. <laughs> no, it was brilliant. I remember when I was younger, I used to smoke in front, well, not, not directly in front of him, but I used to steal his cigarettes and say, you can't tell me not to smoke because you smoke. And I hated smoking, but it was sort of my way to try to get him to quit. And it's interesting because my dad has a very addictive personality. He's a, whatever you can get addicted to, my dad has done it. And by the way, he's never going to listen to the podcast, which is the only reason why I can share this with you. But, and I would say that I have somewhat of an addictive, I guess, Tend, ten, I have addictive tendencies, 
But being a habit researcher helps a lot because I'm very aware of, okay, if I do this, you know, if I go, say, for example, if I go to the petrol station and I grab a chocolate bar while I'm there, that association is going to repeat in my head that when I go, next time I go to fill up and get some fuel, I'm going to think of the chocolate bar. And so I'm not going to repeat that cycle. So I'm pretty good at being really conscious of this. But, you know, I've studied neuroscience. I've studied psychology. I've studied the brain. And you've ran out of petrol many times. <laughs> exactly. I, and, I, and, and chocolate. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm so aware that for everyday people, it must, it's a constant battle to be saying no to these really high dopaminergic things. You know, I ran a survey recently with about 700 Australians of all ages, all different, different management levels. And I asked them what their most unwanted habits were. And they come back with the same things every time. It's scrolling too much on my phone, watching too much television, snacking when I'm not hungry, uh, snoozing my alarm. It's all these things that are essentially giving us a sense of pleasure. So of course they're addictive. Of course we're going to do them a lot more than when we don't want to. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Now in this episode, we really want to focus on, well, how do we actually balance this pain pleasure scale? How do we start to feel a sense of contentment without wanting to grab these dopaminergic stimulants like our phone or like sugar? And there's so much awesome research around this. And, you know, there's a real paradox when it comes to happiness. And it's that the pursuit of pleasure for its own sake will make us even more unhappy. And Ross, you touched on this beautifully earlier in the podcast. When we chase things that give us pleasure, whether it's drugs or gambling or too much chocolate, we find ourselves on the pain balance of the pain pleasure scale. Happiness actually comes by regularly doing things that are hard, that have some meaning and purpose, and that are consistent with our values and that are morally good. So the really fascinating thing with a pain pleasure balance is that, okay, we know that too much pleasure gives us pain, pain pleasure. But here's what the research shows. This is super cool. If you do something that's slightly painful, and I'm not talking about like physical pain, okay? When you do something slightly painful, you actually get some pleasure. So pain Painful things could be an ice bath, like cold water therapy. It could be doing a workout when you really didn't feel like doing a workout. It could be saying no to that second helping of dessert. When we actually give our brain that little bit of pain, we experience dopamine, we experience pleasure, which is part of the reason why when you really don't feel like working out and you do it anyway, you feel awesome. Like, yes, there's endorphins and all that other stuff, but you also feel motivated and that's dopamine. I mean, I'd never actually realized that. That's an incredibly important point. And yeah, mm. and that's probably one of the rushes with exercise that when you do exercise, that you do get that little bit of pain with it that then pushes out a bit more dopamine. Yeah. And it also, it does yeah. release Isn't it endorphin. Cool? Is endorphin. It so. does, all the other things. But the feeling of motivation, you yeah. know, that like, oh, yeah, I'm actually really into this. That is, you know, a lot of that is dopamine, or at least it helps us to reinforce the behavior of wanting to do it again, yep. which is really cool. Okay, there are three golden rules to balancing our dopamine levels, and here they are. Firstly, do not use stimulants too often. Secondly, avoid reflexive triggers, and I'll go through these. And thirdly, avoid layering dopamine Ooh, peaks. Well, I'd like to hear about this. So what this, do I yeah. mean? All right. So don't use stimulants too often. Very, that one's a pretty easy one to understand. Let's say you are aware that you're scrolling on your phone too much. Ross, this is so hard to talk to you about this because you don't seem to have a phone addiction, but the majority of people, I would say more than 70% from recent surveys, do say that they feel like they're using their devices too much. And we have an episode on that. So say that's your thing. You're scrolling too much. The idea is to try to limit your use. It's much easier said than done, but it's putting boundaries around your dopamine so that you're not peaking too often. When we peak too often, we that's what happens when we're creating dopamine tolerance. And then we need more and more and more. And there's no end to this. And then soon enough, you know, one thing leads to another and, you know, we're going to need more dopamine than natural things are going to give us. Well, can, can I just butt in for a second Please and talk about the, the greatest addictive drug on the planet? You know what that is? No. Thing called coffee. 
and that is a stimulant. And, and it's a really yep. good point that the studies show beyond a doubt that if you have a couple of cups, two or three cups of coffee a day, you reduce your mm. risk for gallstones, kidney stones, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, many common cancers, type 2 diabetes, depression and heart mm. failure. So a couple of cups of coffee a day, which is a stimulant, is actually good for you. And here's the whole thing about yeah. balance. But once you get to more than five cups a day, you increase your risk for a heart attack by 20%, osteoporosis, anxiety, a whole lot of things. So it's about getting the right balance there, not going overboard. Mm. As I said, the biggest yeah. addictive drug in the world, coffee. Coffee, yeah, fascinating. Interesting because coffee does increase our dopamine, sometimes in, in good ways, but yes, absolutely, more too much of it is a terrible idea. So no more than two cups then, is that yeah, the advice? Two to three cups a day is, should should be the ceiling dose above that. No, and, and also there's caffeine and other things, but in a standard cup of coffee yeah. you might buy in a coffee shop is about 100 milligrams of caffeine, cup of tea, 40 milligrams, that dreadful thing that people drink at times called Coca-Cola, 40 milligrams of caffeine, <laughs> and, and I think energy drinks should be banned, mm, banned. Agreed with you. They're banned in they some countries. In I don't country. know why they're not here. I think one day we should lobby for yep. it. Okay, let's do that. We'll do that after this episode. But my second point <laughs> of the absolute golden rule with uh, dopamine is to avoid reflexive triggers. So what I mean by this is think of the things that you do reflexively. So when I was writing my PhD thesis, for example, whenever I'd get stuck on a word, I would find my head in my pantry looking for some stuff. You know what you're going to say then. <laughs> my head in my pantry. Yeah. Head in the pantry. Yeah. Ross, oh my God. Head in my pantry looking for snacks. And it was reflexive. It's quick. A lot of people will, you know, they tell me that they'll be sitting on the couch and they're watching telly and they're also on their phone. It's like their phone's within reach. There's this reflex to just grab dopamine whenever we feel like it. My advice with avoiding reflexive triggers is have don't have dopaminergic things within arm's reach. So for me, for example, if I'm sitting at my desk, I won't do things on my work computer that I might do at my, on my computer somewhere else. So for example, I won't watch YouTube on my work computer. I won't go on social media on my work computer because I don't ever want to be, you know, stuck on a difficult email or project and then go, oh, I'll just flick over to Facebook and scroll on there. And and that because that reflexive trigger is terrible for our concentration mm. and for our brain. Yep. Sounds very wise to me. Totally agree. And the last one then is avoid layering dopamine peaks. This one's a classic. Mm. So what do I mean by dopamine? Don't watch TV and scroll on your phone at the same time. Don't have a coffee and then an energy drink and then go do this killer workout with like your favorite upbeat music. There's way too many dopamine peaks that we're making our dopamine too high. So we're going to come down crashing. Mm. Can I that. tell you a story about patient of mine, 35 year old man, in the space of an hour had three double shot cappuccinos, set his heart Ooh. into overdrive atrial fibrillation and developed an acute Ooh. dilated cardiomyopathy, which we've got him out of. And he, he couldn't explain to me why he did that, but it's exactly what you're yeah. saying. He layered those peaks, boom, 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 and he had all sorts mm. of health issues. Boom. That's crazy town. Why, why was he having so much he, coffee? He couldn't explain it to me. He just did. Mm. Wow. Okay. Interesting. He was, I wonder if he was having like lows from dopamine and no, I'm sure there was something else. Anyhow, but anyway, it's very interesting. the hell out of him. He's never done it again. His heart's now back to normal. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you were able to fix him up. Well done, Dr. Ross. Thank you. All right. We have gone through all the things to avoid. Now, I just want to go through a little list of things to do to help you to naturally restore your dopamine. So I have gone through all the research. I compiled a list of all these lifestyle things that we can do that really help that pain pleasure balance to come back to a natural homeostasis again. The first one, and to come at no surprise, is getting enough good quality sleep. It is so important. I have always said the most underrated thing we can do for our health is sleep. Sleep deprivation reduces dopamine levels and adequate sleep restores those levels again. It's recommended we get on average seven to nine hours of sleep a night. So make sleep a priority. And we have a whole session on sleep together, don't we, Ross? We're going to be doing at least a whole episode on sleep. Now, the other one is an interesting one. It's engaging in non-sleep deep rest. So something like yoga nidra. 
which is a really powerful relaxation practice. It's been shown to increase that baseline dopamine level by a whopping 65% huge. All yoga nidra is essentially doing is helping you to shut down your brain activity without you actually being asleep. It's like giving your brain a little rest. It's awesome. Have you ever done yoga nidra, Ross? I've done a bit of yoga, but I, my uh, go-to thing here really is meditation. I, I've been meditating mm. for the last 30 years every day. Ooh, tell me about your meditation. Just before you yeah. do though, yoga nidra is a meditation. Mm. It's so weirdly named because people often do think it's yoga. My mum thought it was yoga. She's like, I didn't know you did yoga. I'm like, my, it's yoga nidra. Mm. Hilarious. It is a meditation. So tell me about your meditation. Well, I've been doing TM for the last 30 years that I've modified. I do a some affirmations within it, but I get into a very deep meditative state. And, mm -hmm. and some, some days it, it, I, I feel it was of no benefit, but I'd say six days out of seven, because I've been doing it every day for 30 years, I, I probably missed one or wow. two days in 30 years, uh, I, I would get in pretty close to bliss. It's wonderful. Wow, mm. what an incredible habit. Do you mind me asking, what time of day do you do First it? Like, is it morning. after a certain thing? As soon as I wake up. First thing. And sometimes I try to squeeze in a bit of meditation in the afternoon as well, which is lovely. Mm. Oh, I love that for you. Your dopamine must be through the roof. Awesome love stuff. Think, <laughs> the third point on the list is viewing morning sunlight for two to 10 minutes within eight hours of waking. And that can increase our dopamine by about 50%. And the earlier you view sunlight after waking, the better. Now the idea is not to stare at the sun. Please don't do that, people. You just wanna be outside you can't be viewing the sunlight behind glass. Glasses are okay, but not glass. And I just, just sit and have your breakfast outside if you can. That's my tip. If you can't have breakfast outside, if you're driving straight away, roll down your window at least so that you've got that natural light coming in. It really does so much wonders to your dopamine. And I'm sure you felt it. You know, you've I'm sure you felt the feeling of sitting outside in the sun and just almost like feeling re-energized by it. Fantastic. Oh, it's a wonderful thing to do. It is. Now you're going to love this next tip, Ross, and it's doing cardiovascular exercise. It's moving your body in ways that you enjoy that increase your heart rate and that are going to help to restore your dopamine levels. Tell us about your exercise, Ross. Okay. What I do when I wake up after I finish meditating, I then do 20 minutes of weights and stretching every morning. So that's first thing in the morning. And then in the afternoon mm -hmm. when I come home from work, uh, when I finished talking with you, with you uh, today, I'll do 30 minutes on my exercise bike, which sits just over my shoulder here. So I'll do 30 minutes oh. on the bike. That, and I do that most days of the week, if not every day. Wow. Do you have rest days? No. No, no, typically no. Don't need to rest when you're Ross, do no, you? Well, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I typically don't. But there are times when you're just too busy, you've got something on, you don't always get to do it. Yeah. But I, I would say at least six days out of seven, I do, I do that. I do my weights and stretching every morning and six days out of seven, I do the exercise bike at least. Oh, that's impressive. Stretching is one of those things I really want to make, you know, a more ingrained habit in my life. That's something I'm going to focus on now, especially now that I'm inspired by you. So thanks for that, Ross. <laughs> I've got two more tips to give you to help balance your dopamine. And one of them is eating foods that contain the amino acid tyrosine. Tyrosine is found in things like cheese, soybeans, beef, lamb, pork, fish, chicken, nuts, eggs, beans, and whole grains and tyrosine has been found to help increase our dopamine in a really natural way so we're not getting these huge spikes it's not going to have and result in a come down it's just going to give you that nice baseline level it's just going to help you feel motivated to do your everyday required tasks and the last one surprisingly is drinking caffeine make sure that you avoid having caffeine after 2 p.m so that it doesn't impact your sleep and no more than two or three cups of coffee a day now we talked about pleasure and pain and how giving yourself that little bit of pain gives you a lot of pleasure and research has shown over and over again that if you take a one to three minute cold shower as cold as you can tolerate it's going to dramatically increase your baseline dopamine for hours afterwards so for people who haven't done this before my advice is start with just 10 seconds at the end of your shower so have your shower and then once you're done showering turn that nozzle to cold count to 10 and step outside 
And then you can do that for a week and then increase it to 20 seconds and then 30 seconds and work your way up to a minute. You're not going to feel like doing it, but I promise you, you will feel so alive. I encourage you not to talk yourself out of this. It is such an awesome habit. I had about 300 people doing this a couple of weeks ago and the comments I was getting, I was, was blowing up. Like they were breaking the internet with how much they just couldn't believe how good they felt after just doing this, you know, seemingly difficult little task. Ross, what do you think of ice, you know, ice water well, therapy? Well, cold, 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 cold water, water therapy. therapy. The studies are showing at a medical level that if you uh, are exposed to water below 20 degrees Celsius for a period of time, I mean, you said a few minutes and that's probably all you need, but people who do more than that, there's incredible benefits on the immune system, cardiovascular health, et cetera, et cetera. So, yes, I totally agree with this. The evidence is very strong. Is it something you've ever tried? Go on, no, be honest. No, so, no, it's not something. <laughs> I mean, I, I always go under a cold shower for a, uh, you know, 20, 30 seconds before the heat comes on, but I don't know. I've, I've never okay. done cold water. I'm a bit of, look, I, when I swim, people think I'm having some sort of medical issue. I'm, I'm a really, I'm a really <laughs> bad swimmer, I can tell you. It's never been an expertise of mine. I love, I love swimming, but I'm just not good at it. But you can have a cold oh, shower yep. or sit in a nice very, bath. Very good you don't have to swim yeah, around in it. <laughs> I love it. I actually have an ice bath at home. It's no credit to me at all. It's my husband's. He's he's obsessed with it. He's crazy. Like he'll get up first thing in the morning. He'll go sit in this ice bath. And sometimes he's in there for so long. Oh, I think he's passed out, but he hasn't. He's He just sits there for about eight oh. minutes. It's He's an absolute lunatic. He'll come out, his body's burning red. Like, And he's like, oh, good morning, darling. Like as though it's nothing. And then sometimes I'll pull up a chair and go have a chat with him. He doesn't even flinch. He just loves it. Well, uh, you're not selling it, but anyhow. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not selling it. Whereas I do 30 seconds and I want to give myself a gold medal Mm. for Mm. doing 30 seconds. I'm like, go team. But to be fair, I do feel awesome. There have actually been a few times where I've just felt a bit lully in the afternoon and I've jumped in the ice bath and I just, I feel invigorated. It was like having a coffee. So that's something else definitely be doing, especially as it comes into summer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You'll leave that yep. one to me. All right. That's fine. <laughs> now to wrap up this week's episode, we'll now be answering our member question of the week. If you missed last week's episode, we shared an exciting announcement that we will now be dedicating the last five to 10 minutes of each episode to answering our member questions, given we've received so many wonderful questions from the listeners at home. So if you have any health and wellness related questions that you'd love Dr. Ross or myself to answer on the podcast, all you have to do is head to me yagi.coach forward slash podcast where you'll be able to submit a form you can leave your name and, and pop your question in there and today we're going to answer one of our very first questions that we've received from a listener in regards to episode six on Ross's five keys to optimal health. This one's from Mary. I'm currently going through menopause and I'm finding it difficult to get good quality sleep and I'm experiencing insomnia and hot flashes. Do you have any tips on how to improve my sleep? Oof, good one, Yeah, Mary. well, I, I think we should actually spend time on a podcast to go through all aspects of sleep. But in particular, if a person's going through menopause, they really need to possibly even consider some form of hormone replacement therapy. And and I my favorite hormone replacement therapy is bioidentical hormones. Uh, rather than taking pharmaceutical um, hormone replacement therapy, there are some non-medical things you can do as well. But I really think we need to dedicate a, a lot longer talking about sleep. But I think that Mary needs to go and speak to a doctor to see what options are available to her along the hormone replacement therapy line, and uh, and then we can then focus on all the things you can do. But one of the big issues for all of this, when you're going through menopause, focusing on those five keys of being healthy, that will really help as well. Good nutrition, regular exercise, trying to generate good quality sleep habits, being happy, all of these things will certainly help you sleep and help your menopause. So good, Ross. I must say menopause is really taking a stage this year, which I think is fantastic. It's something that we, it's so good to talk more about. And I know that sleep tends to be one of sleep and especially hot flashes and the, and the discomfort of that seems to be one of the biggest 
concerns or reports from women. So thank you for helping us with that, Ross. And yeah, I definitely agree. We should definitely do a whole episode on sleep. I'm sure we will. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's episode on Eat, Live and Move with Miyagi. We hope you've enjoyed our two-part series on dopamine and taken away some practical tips on how to naturally balance your dopamine levels. Next week, we're going to take a turn into the realm of movement and explore why resistance training is so important to add to our routine, especially as we age. Plus, we're going to share some practical tips on ways you can simply incorporate some resistance training to improve your health and support your metabolism for weight loss. Whatever platform you're listening to today, please make sure you do subscribe so you don't miss out on an episode when we drop one. That's all from us. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.